Hey everybody, Mr. Farmer here, and today we're talking about AP Macro Graphs by College Board Unit. Let's get started with Unit 1. So for Unit 1, the focus is opportunity cost and comparative advantage, and realistically there's only one graph, which is the production possibility curve or production possibility frontier. So again, the curve itself is called the full employment curve. Full employment, or FE, kind of like the LRA, as we'll talk about later. So if you're producing anywhere on this curve, you're producing at your fully utilized resources, those factors of production, but at the macro level, since we're talking about that. If you're inside the curve, like point D or E, you are under utilizing or under producing or under allocating resources, all that kind of stuff. And then point F you can see is, is outside of our ability to produce from an academic level. Yes, you can go over time and produce beyond uh, in reality, but for economic purposes, you want to produce at your full employment level. Well, footnotes, you definitely use this for things like comparative advantage. We have X and Y, and they can produce goods A and B and A and B, and you figure out the comparative advantage for each thing. Uh, so, for instance, Y would have the compare advantage of production of A since they give up one fifth of their when they of B when they produce one unit of A, whereas X gives up uh, one half of B. So they give up more; they have a higher opportunity cost. So you can definitely link that to here. Also, things like um, terms of trade, rate, trade range, economic um, gains are all things uh, that could be done with this. Unit two is the uh, economic indicator, so unemployment, inflation, business cycle, and real versus nominal GDP. So much more on the uh, mathematical side. For instance, the real versus nominal GDP equation um, that we've gone over before. Graphically, really just the business cycle though. And so this is the four part parts to is the expansion, the peak, the recession, and the trough. And we get names for like the positive output we're talking about when you look at the ASAD and the LRS as far as a uh, positive GDP gap or an expansionary gap. It comes from this term. And then we have the recessionary gap or the negative gap, which is where my actual, which is this actual like full red curve, is in this case less than my potential, which is going to be this kind of dotted um, pale red curve here. For during times of expansion and peak, you'd assume there would be lower levels of unemployment and traditionally higher level of inflation. And so again, we'd kind of stick with that. And yes, in current circumstances, uh, in current times, this has been questioned as far as does this occur or not. We'll just say that it does for right now um, since we're staying with academic versions. And then during recessions and trough, we would have high levels of unemployment and probably lower levels of inflation would be the anticipation at least. Unit three, just flying through, is the one of the bigger ones. ASAD, spending multiplier, LRS, change ASAD, long run self-adjustment, fiscal policies, automatic stabilizers, and you can guess the graphs are ASAD and the LRAS. So the aggregate, aggregate demand, aggregate supply, things to watch out for are the shape of the aggregate supply curve. Now, this isn't as big of a conversation anymore, um, but you can, I have seen FRQs, for instance, that's talking about the Keynesian, and the idea is it is the flatter portion of this. In some extreme cases, you can get the completely flat and then upwards. So if you are at the bottom out section and you have a decrease in the aggregate demand, for instance, there is zero change to the price level because of Keynesian economics, sticky wages, and all those kinds of things. For the um, SRAS, uh, really kind of things and changes in productivity or macro level uh, resource prices can change. I use things like energy. So things like supply shocks can happen. For aggregate demand, the determinants are c plus i plus g plus the net exports and i know that's the case because the 
real GDP equals nominal GDP divided by the price index in hundreds. We've seen this equation. And if I switch this around a little bit, real GDP times the price index in hundreds, which is effectively the price level over here, equals GDP. Okay, so here's my real GDP times my price level. This area would then equal the GDP, and GDP equals C plus I plus G plus net exports. And so the aggregate demand curve is actually our GDP. So what can change the aggregate demand? Anything that changes the expenditure approach, which is why so many things go with this. A couple of things to know as far as the real GDP. Real GDP and unemployment have an inverse relationship. So if I'm at real GDP X and for some reason I then go to real GDP Y, since more stuff is being produced, I would have a lower level of unemployment. If you produce more, you probably need more people working, so you have a lower unemployment. So we will assume that this has an inverse relationship there. The LRAS is the output at your full employment. So this is the output at full employment. What is full employment? Full employment is when you have zero cyclical unemployment. You have the other three seasonally adjusted or not. You have uh, you have zero cyclical unemployment. And so it is when you have your natural rate of unemployment, which is the same thing as my full employment. So when I'm at my natural rate of unemployment, how much stuff can you produce? So I usually assume it's about a four to six percent natural rate of unemployment. Currently it's four and change. Um, I'll just say it is four percent, just so we have an exact number. So if I have a labor force of 100 and my natural rate of unemployment is four percent, then that means I have 96 workers working at the time because four percent of my labor force are not working. If these workers have a productivity of one and everything they produce is just worth one dollar, then my full employment natural output is $96. That's my full employment. I'm full using all my resources. I have zero cyclical unemployment. So what can change the LRES? Anything that can change productivity. Or if you change the number of full employment workers, what if I now have 200 workers? Okay, then I have still 4%. So I have 192 people working times one. Well, now my full employment is over here at 192. Let's just assume I did my numbers correctly. I think I did my math right. Or what if instead I'm still at my 96, but now my productivity right here has doubled for whatever reason, technology or whatever else. Well, then again, I can increase that. It can go the other way as well, but kind of plugging into this simple concept can help you identify if there's a change to the LRAS. As far as changes to the aggregate supply versus changes to the LRAS, uh, questions on changes on input prices is a common one. If it seemed to not be a permanent change, the price of oil changed for a moment. Well, that would be a simple change in aggregate supply. But if we assume it's going to be a permanent change, for a long time Saudi Arabia said that uh, price of oil barrels weren't going to go up beyond this limit. They, they, they had a number on there. Well, then that was a fairly permanent change for a little bit. Okay, there was a price ceiling essentially uh, put on that by OPEC, Saudi Arabia. Okay, then that would change the LRAS because it wasn't going to change around or tax changes is a permanent change until legislation gets put across. So the two different kinds of gaps we have are recessionary 
and inflationary. And again, these gaps come from the business cycle mentality. So what we do is we compare my full employment compared to my actual. Actual minus potential equals gap. So if my actual is over here at 10 and my full employment is over here at, based on my number line, I'll just say 20, make note numbers here. I then have a negative GDP gap, negative 10 in this case. So this is a recessionary gap or a negative GDP gap. And over here we have our 20 full employment, but now my actual AS equals AD is at 25. 25 actual minus 20, my potential equals a positive 5. So we have inflationary gap expansionary gap again based on the business cycle or a positive GDP gap. Now does the economy self adjust? This is where you can get into uh, changes in fiscal policy. These typically are just going to change the aggregate demand. Okay, so that's going to be kind of the, the assumption there. Um, is that was going to happen. So you might say, hey, let's uh, go ahead and um, increase subsidies. Let's decrease taxes. Okay, then that's going to change these things. You could also go into monetary policies, make money more readily available. We're going to talk more about that when we talk about interest rates. If I assume that this AD1 had been my original, and then we have an increase in AD for whatever reason. Does the economy self-adjust? Yes, the self-adjustment is going to be on the L on the SRAS. So long run adjustments, long run adjustments, adjust the aggregate supply exclusively. Why? Well, kind of here's a little story I tell. You're running a business and you pay your workers $10 an hour. Okay. Well, then all of a sudden the prices go up. And so all the, the goods that my workers would have bought now cost $12 per hour. So they can't actually make ends meet. So what are they going to do? They're going to say, you know, what? the rational expectation theory, the RET, if you remember that one, is you should pay me more since it's more expensive. And eventually everybody be asking for that because either you pay me more so I can actually buy stuff or I have to go find a different job. Okay, so we're going to adjust the uh, resource inputs that could be uh, workers hours, it could be electricity might change also it's not just workers wages. And so now I'm going to go back and I'm going to pay everybody $14 per hour and they will have bought everything's $14 so effectively my real income has actually not changed at this point. My $10 can now, or my $14 can buy what my $10 used to be able to. So again, this goes into real wages and real income as well. But this is the self-adjustment idea. The AS will shift back as resource prices, workers or others, increase or decrease. For economic purposes, we can say this can go in the decrease order as well. Unit four, all the banking stuff. And so a graph from the market, money market graph and the loanable funds graph. So we have the money market graph. Uh, we have the supply money and the demand of money. Supply money is M1. And the only thing that can change this is a change to monetary policies. Anything else is going to change the demand. For the demand, there's two parts. There is the transaction demand. And then there is the asset demand. So the way I like to think about this is <clears throat> anything that is to the right over here uh, is going to be money that is going to be um, put into the money market account. Okay. Anything to the anything to the left is money that will go towards an alternative investment. Okay, 
And so the idea is that if all of a sudden the supply curve, for whatever reason, shifts to the right, this money market graph is now a worse interest rate because this is money that the investor, the customer will get paid back. And so since I get less money here, I'm more likely to invest in other places. So what does this look like? Well, if there's an increase in the supply, which is what I just said, and decreasing of interest rates, people are going to go spend that money on something. And so you're going to take whatever this amount of money was, and you're going to go spend it either households or businesses will increase their investment spending in some way because they don't get as much out of holding money in the form of money. And so this is the idea. If the interest rate decreases, people spend to tend to spend more money. Now, again, for academic purposes, because of College Board, we will pretty much say that a change in interest rates will affect the aggregate demand curve. Although there is an argument as far as changes in aggregate supply, more so with the loanable funds. The nice part is the output will always be consistent. So interest rates and bond prices, uh, here's what you need to know. Interest rates and bond prices have an inverse relationship. You can look at the bond price uh, video if you want to kind of think about why. But essentially, it's if the interest rates increase, then the bond prices, there's going to be an increase in demand for the original bonds because their bonds were at a um, uh, a better price. Okay, um, And so that's going to be happening here. So this is for the current bonds. Interest rates go up. The price for current bonds changes. But usually when we say interest rates and bond price, you're talking about bonds that previously existed. And so you do need to be careful about this. Okay. And so if interest rates increase, the prices of bonds that already existed for all the marketable bonds would have decreased. Why? Because they're back here. They're at that lower interest rate. And now you get a better one over here. Well, then there will be a decrease in demand for the original bond prices because you don't get as good of an interest rate there. Loanable funds. So loanable funds graph, the supply is excess reserves. So what can change the supply? Anything that changes the excess reserves. So typically it's going to be monetary policies. But it could also be uh, changes in savings. Why? Well, if we have our assets and net worth liability, if someone says, hey, I'm over here, I want to save more money, then they're going to put their money into a bank, and now this bank has some amount of money. And they therefore have reserves of some amount of money. And some portion is going to be required and some portion is going to be excess reserve savings supply. Okay, so that is something else. Okay, um, so there's kind of two things for this. As far as demand, it's why would you want to borrow money? Now, it definitely stand out is a thing called the crowding out effect, which is when if the government decides to spend money, we know that they then borrow some money from the Federal Reserve. But if since they borrow money, we have a change in the demand. And so as the prices would go up, the interest rates increases, that crowds the public from uh, spending more money. So for instance, if there is an increase in the demand, that would lead to a decrease in the aggregate demand over here because interest rates are more expensive. It is um, less likely for people to borrow money. So we have a decrease in the uh, businesses or household spending. You could also have a claim for a decrease in the aggregate supply since people aren't going to be, um, it's more expensive to have uh, financial capital. Um, although the decrease in aggregate supply is not as likely. 
And again, if you have a change in, uh, change in supply instead, you actually get the same outcome because again, those interest rates increase. One thing I do want to talk about though is what if you have an increase in supply or a decrease in demand? You have a lower interest rates. Well, in this case, you could either have an increase in aggregate demand. It's cheaper money to borrow. Okay. You could also have a change in the aggregate supply. And I've definitely seen this when they say because of the change to the interest rates, how this change economic growth, for instance. And so what this is linking to is the idea that the lower interest rates, lower interest rates would lead to an increase in purchases of capital, which is going to increase productivity. And this is what we talk when we talk about the LRAS table. Since they spend more money on capital, they would be able to produce more stuff. And so this could shift everything around. So again, if they ask, how does this affect economic growth? They're looking at the aggregate supply curve. How does this affect unemployment? Well, no matter what, we would have had an increase in real GDP, therefore the decrease in unemployment. So that's actually going to be uh, the same thing. But this is something to look out for as far as the economic growth question. Unit 5. Fiscal uh, monetary policies in short run, Phillips curve, uh, money growth, crowding out, all those fun kinds of things. So the short run Phillips curve, are, we have inflation on the y-axis and unemployment on the x-axis. And we start out, and it's it's an observation piece of the ASAB. So which kind of, here's point A, it's the original equilibrium for the market, or for the uh, country. And then we just pick an A. And then there's a change in aggregate demand. What's that going to do? A change in aggregate demand moves along the Phillips curve. Inflation goes up inflation went up real output increased inverse relationship decrease in unemployment so change in aggregate demand is a movement along the phillips curve well if there's a change in the aggregate supply well here we have a graph of here point a point b and then here's my lras and we'll assume that the economy self adjusts. So there we have C. And then you're going to see how we get C right here. So how do we get to point C? Well, inflation goes up. So inflation is going to go up and real output decreases. Therefore, unemployment must increase. So how can we get to point C over here? Oh, the Phillips curve. Sorry, it's not bent. I just did a straight angle. It should be uh, curved. Uh, shifted over so a change in the aggregate supply will lead to a change in the phillips curve okay you can memorize that they go in inverse relationships if there's a decrease over here if there's an increase over here or just map it out which is what i definitely suggest the long run phillips curve is the natural rate of unemployment and so just like before let me go back for a second we started out at this <coughs> full employment and eventually we go back to our full employment six percent according to this apparently and that's the idea behind the phillips curve or the long run phillips curve is that eventually you will go back to the natural rate of unemployment as reflected by the lres what happens if the lres shifts then you're not shouldn't be using the phillips curve it honestly just cannot adjust for that last unit is the foreign exchange markets uh, but again pretty much everything else can definitely link to this so here we have the forex graph we have the foreign currency per domestic currency the dollar in this case we have the supply and the demand so the little story i like to tell is i have i'll say this is country y is the foreign currency and country x is the uh, domestic currency you have X, you have Y, and then you have this 4X market. And this is actually what we're going to be graphing. Now, something is going to want to happen between these two trade partners. Um, country Y might say, I want more goods. 
and services. Okay, in order to buy from country X, because it's flung this way, country Y needs to pay for this. But country X only will accept currency X. And country Y only has Y currency. So what do they do? They're going to sell their Y currency in exchange, get X back. So what's happening is there's an increase in demand from this foreign exchange market. So we have an increase in demand over here. So what's happened to country X, because again, this is the denominator, it, that's what this whole tale is about. Well, then the currency has appreciated. There's an increase in demand for it. And you can use this to really talk about lots of different things. What about investment? What about whatever else it is? At the same time, if I had done X per Y using the same scenario, what happens? Now this forex market, they have more units of Y. That'll be a change in supply here. So Y has then depreciated. These two graphs say the exact same thing. X appreciates is the same thing as saying Y has depreciated. So the function is marking the ASAD. So there's a thing called the purchasing power parity theory. And essentially it says, if there's an increase in the price level, aka increase in inflation, then the foreign groups, whoever that might be, want to buy less. Increase aggregate demand, demand pull inflation, whatever else it is. Okay, there's increased inflation. What's going to happen to this country? Well, there's going to be a decrease in demand for this currency. Why? Foreign groups want to buy less. Now, this is called the purchasing power parity because overall for this foreign country, eventually it kind of balances itself out. The increase in inflation is balanced out by the decrease in the exchange rates. And so overall, it's about null. Uh, to this foreign investor. So this is called the purchasing power parity theory. Uh, and that's just kind of how this works back and forth. So if inflation goes up, you want to buy less. So that goes down. Now this goes down, what happens? Well, since this currency is now depreciated, there's going to be an increase in the exports because now the other country wants to buy more of them. They're on sale. Great. Increase in aggregate demand. And it goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. How about interest rates? For the foreign market, interest rates for the forex market is exclusive to investment. Do you want a better investment? Now we can use a little bit of the Fisher effect here if we want, um, which is the nominal, let's do it this way, nominal interest rate equals the real interest rate plus inflation. And so if I assume inflation to be held steady, uh, it is there is no change here, then nominal and real interest rates should mirror each other. With that said, that's why for the foreign exchange market, these graphs are kind of interchangeable as far as what our end result is going to be. Let's say there's a increase in the supply. Well, then there's a lower interest rate, which means the foreign investors are going to want to invest less into this bank, for instance. They're going to buy fewer securities in this bank. Why? Because the new bonds are lower interest rates. If it's lower interest rates, that would be a decrease in the demand for this currency based on the loanable funds graph. Let's say instead that there's an increase in the demand for money. Uh, maybe, for instance, the price level increased. So now you need an increase in the amount of money to buy the same amount of goods. Increase in transaction demand. Increase interest rates. Oh, well, now it is a better investment opportunity. Yep, I want to buy more goods here. Okay, I want to buy more of this based on the money market graph. You could also make arguments for changes in the supply curve. Uh, the domestic investors are going to pull their money from the international. 
groups because now their domestic is going to have a better investment opportunity. So you could make a claim for a decrease in the supply in the Forex graphing. And that's why I kind of like doing my little here's X and here's Y type scenario. Okay, X is going to not invest as much as going to decrease. And they would have used currency Y to do this. There's a decrease in the demand for that. Okay, and so you can kind of play around with this and kind of fill in your narration as far as is more money being put, there's less money being put towards the market and a decrease in the demand being pulled from it as well. So you can kind of fill this little narration for this. Last thing I want to kind of talk about is just the chain reaction type events that can happen. Um, there's a worksheet for it called the chain reaction worksheet. Um, but it'd be things like how about the ASAD? Then how does that affect the loanable funds, for instance, for inflation, for instance? And then because of the change to the so change to price level it means now it's more expensive, so you might need to borrow more money in order to accomplish the same thing. So that's going to change the demand here, which is going to change the interest rates, the real interest rates. Because of the change in interest rates, that might affect the bond price again, that inverse relationship here. How about the money market graph to the ASAD? And then from there, economic growth, talking about the change to aggregate supply potentially. Or fiscal policy or monetary policy or understanding the relationships between these is really a key component to the college board test. So hopefully after going through this, it makes a little more sense. Hope that helped. Until next time, catch you later.